So, we learned a lot about the binomial distribution so far. Let's review the letters, what these things mean. We'll talk about the mean, the variance standard deviation, and how to use that as far as usual and unusual, unusual goes as well. So, when we're talking about binomial, uh, well, there's only two outcomes. What are those two outcomes for our binomial distribution? Good. So, uh, we can categorize a lot of things as binomial just depending on what we consider to be a success and what we consider to be a failure, even such things like rolling a die. Even though there's six outcomes, we say one of those outcomes is a, is a success and the rest of them are failures, and we can use binomial with that. What's the letter N stand for? Good. Now the trials are fixed, so we're only doing our procedure a certain number of times. What's lowercase letter P? The what now? Probability of success. Probability of a single success. So on a trial by trial basis, what's the probability you are going to get a successful outcome? And the Q would be the failure, the probability you're going to get a failure on a single outcome. What does X stand for then? Say that again. The number of successes we're, yeah, we're looking for, or that you're considering. So P stands for the probability for each success. X would be the number of successes that you're, you're looking to have happen, or that you're considering for this case. So if we're rolling a die and we're looking for fours, if fours are success, X is not four. X is the number of fours you want to get, or the number of fours that you're considering getting. And I just hope that makes sense to you. We talked about this for a long time, last last section. Now, today, in 5.4, we get to find the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation. Now, we know that variance and standard deviation are very closely linked. If we have one, we have the other. You guys awake today? You guys with it? Yeah. Yeah. Be with it today. It's going to go quick. It's all good stuff. It's going to go quick. 5.4, we're talking about the mean, the variance, And as a corollary, the standard deviation of a binomial distribution. Let's talk about the mean first. So the mean. Now, for a certain procedure, we know that binomial distributions are going to have a fixed number of trials, right? Yeah, that's a fixed yeah. number. No, don't, don't go on forever. So if it, we have a fixed number of trials, we get to consider all of them. If we roll the die a thousand times, we consider all thousand rolls, right? That means we're not taking a sample of that procedure, we're taking the whole thing for that procedure. For that reason, for the mean, we're not going to be using X bar. X bar is for the sample mean. Does that make sense? What are we going to use? What's the mean for a population? Oh, come on, you know this. It sounds like a cow. Mu. Mu, that's right. Remember I made the mu. It's on video. It's the best mu you've ever heard. Unless you live on a dairy. You have a little bit there up there. So yeah, we're, since we're considering all of the trials, we're not taking samples of trials, because in all of them we're going to use mu, which stands for, of course, the mean. It, it looks even like an M. Here's how I want you to think about the mean. The mean is the number of successes that you should get out of your procedure. Does that make sense? The mean is the number of successes you should get out of your procedure. The number of successes you expect, remember that, that word expected value, same, same idea as the mean. The number of successes you expect to occur out of your procedure or from your procedure. The number of successes you expect to occur. Well, let's think about that. Let's think about that. The probability of each success occurring is, what what, num what letter was that again? The probability of each success occurring? Little p. Little p, that's right. Take a look at the little p there. So that's the probability of each success happening. How many times are we repeating this trial over and over again? What's that letter? 
How many, how many, what stands for our trials? So we have a certain number of trials. Every probability for a success is, is that lowercase letter P. So to find out how many we expect to get, we're going to take the total number of trials and simply multiply that by the probability of success for each one. That will give you the expected value. Let me put it to you this way, okay? Let's say that you roll the die a hundred times and the probability of getting your success, let's say the success is a four and the probability for getting a four is 30%. That was the, the weighted die. Remember that weighted die situation we had? Probability of success was 30%. If you roll the die a hundred times and the probability of getting a four or your success every single time is 30%, you would expect how many successes out of that? If you had 100 rolls, not rolls like bread rolls, rolls like a, a die, or not you, although rolls are good, I'm hungry right now. So. 100 rolls of a die, and the probability of getting, let's say, a, a four, of rolling a four, which is our success. Our success. That's the first time. If you have 100 rolls and the probability every time you roll the die of getting a 4 is 30%, 0 0.30, how many 4s should you expect to get? 30. You should expect to get 30. 30% 30 of the time you're going to get a 4. Does, you, does that make sense to you? 30% of the time you're going to get a 4. So out of 100 rolls, you would expect to get pretty close to 30 4s. Nod your head if you're with me on that. That's the way we're doing our mean. You expect to get 30. You take the number of rolls, number of, of trials for your procedure, multiplied by the probability of success for each trial, that's going to give you the expected number of successes you're looking for, and that is our mean. Raise your hand if you're okay with the mean. Good. Pretty easy to calculate, right? That's kind of nice. Not a whole lot of work. Means really don't have a whole lot of work, but this one's especially nice. Just two numbers. Now, let's look at the variance. What symbol do you use, and you need to know this, what symbol do you use for the variance? What was that one? What was it called? Sigma, yeah, the little, right? The little cannon shape. Sigma? Square. Square, okay, good, variance. That's a symbol for variance right there. Square cannons. Variance gives you pretty much the spread of your data, how, how far it's spread apart. So for our variance, here's how you find that. You actually take your mean. Remember that your variance and your standard deviation is based on your mean. Every time we've found variance and standard deviation has been based somehow on the mean, typically we would subtract the mean, right? We did that with the frequency distribution. You subtracted it uh, or, and, and for, uh, for our data when, when we had those, those data columns. We'd subtract it and then we squared it. Remember doing that? And for the last thing that we did uh, in the, the first part of this, this chapter, we found somehow x squared times p of x, and we added all together, then we subtracted the, mu the mean squared somehow. So somehow it's based on mean. It, it is here, too. It looks a little bit different, though. We're not going to put mu. We're just going to put n times p because it's so easy to represent the mean like that, just n times p. This is kind of nice. It's going to be like, whoa, wait a second. That's kind of crazy. But here's how you figure out the variance. It's just one more thing being multiplied. You multiply the n times the p times the q. That gives you variance. What's the q again? The failure. That failure, when you tack that onto there, gives you another spread of your data. Because right? now you consider everything in there. Now, how do you go from, pretty nice, right? This is it. That's, that's variance. How do you go from variance to standard <coughs> deviation? What do you do? Square it? Or square root it? Okay, so what's the symbol then? Well, what's the, what's the symbol over here on the left-hand side of our equation? Is it still sigma squared? What is it? Yeah, basically, to get from here to here, you take a square root of both sides. The square root will simplify with that square 
the square root will be here on the right hand side. So we're going to have sigma equals the square root of n times p times q. And that's it. That's kind of nice, right? Isn't it? That's not, there's no trick here. This is it. That's it. I'm not going to add anything else on there. You can find the mean, you can find the standard deviation really, really, really easily. It's all about the numbers that, and these variables, which we, that's why we talked about them in opening the class, so you understand what these things are. It's just about those numbers. You take a square root of it, you get the standard deviation. So we do an example to kind of illustrate this. Okay, there was this town, I think this is a, the chapter problem, if it wasn't in this book, it was in a previous book. Uh, there's this town, I don't know if I've talked about it in, in this class with you or not, I really don't remember, frankly, um, in, I think it was New Mexico. And in this town, they, they picked juries out of the general population, just like anybody else. But it turned out that the town is 80% Mexican-American. And all these juries were coming up just with just white people, over and over again. So is that really representative of their, their specific population of people? Now, typically, if you have a jury selection, it should represent your population, right? Which is how juries are picked in the first place. It's supposed to be just a segment of the population so that you get an unbiased trial based on your peer group. So here we have a different type of jury than we would have in New York, or that we have in Florida, or that we would have in New Mexico in this particular situation. So in their area, they were 80% Mexican-American, yet their, their juries were like 80% Caucasian. And it just it wasn't matched up, so they did some, some research on it. And here's what they found out. Here's what we did. A certain population was made up of 80% Mexican American or Hispanic American, whatever you wanna wanna say. Is that nice chiming sound in here? Is that in here or am I going crazy? It isn't here. Okay, no, no more nice chiming. It's very pleasant, but it reminds me of an elevator. I don't like, don't like plummeting to my death. I don't like elevators. Certain populations made up of 80% Mexican Americans. We want to select a jury of 12 people. What we want to find out is what's the mean and the standard deviation for the situation. By doing this, you can figure out what, how many Mexican Americans we should have for our jury. We can figure out what would be usual, what would be unusual, and see if their situation was correct or incorrect. Or if there was, because there was actually a lawsuit on this. Uh, they, they sued the government and said, you're discriminating against us because you're not selecting juries that are, are correct for our situation, right? Which uh, we're going to see if they were, they were right or wrong, or if they had evidence uh, to support that. Okay, and that's what this class is about, is really finding evidence to support things. You with me? That's what we want to get to. So a certain population, 8% Mexican American, great, select a jury of 12. We want to find the mean and standard deviation. Now the math on this is not very hard. It's just you have to understand how to do it, what all these numbers are, what these numbers are that, that I'm giving you. The first thing you're going to do with any binomial distribution, you're going to figure out what you're going to consider a success and what you're going to consider a failure. Now, the connotation here is going to seem a little funny, right? Because you're like, oh, a success. What would a success be if we're looking for Mexican American people? What's a success? What now? Getting a Mexican-American, that's a success. Congratulations, some of you. 
Uh, a failure would be picking anybody else. Sorry, for, that's not what, what we mean here, okay? So uh, Mexican Americans aren't the only successful people, all right? And, and, and failing people, that's not everyone else. So if, if you're not that, that's not what we're talking about. What we're saying is that for the situation, we're considering picking up, uh, not picking up, <laughs> but picking out a Mexican American from a population would be considered a, a success because that's what we're looking for. So in our case, a success is selecting or randomly selecting a Mexican American. <coughs> okay, cool. Selecting a Mexican what's what's the failure? Anything else? I guess that's kind of anybody else, not anything else. Selecting anyone else. Gee, that's sensitive today, I guess, huh? It's like in any other ethnicity. So for this case, they're looking to support their, their case, right? They're looking to see whether Mexican Americans were actually chosen or not. That's why it's considered a success here. They're saying, we're looking for this this group of people to be in our jury, and what should happen if our, if our population is made up of 80% Mexican Americans and everybody else is not Mexican American. What we should get is 80% of that jury should be Mexican American. You guys with me on that? That would represent our population the best. That's what we're trying to figure out. That's why that success is selecting a Mexican American. Now, should it be selecting eight Mexican Americans or a certain number of Mexican Americans? Yes or no? What do you think? Is a, is a success defined as a trial by trial basis or the whole procedure? What do you think? So the trial here is this. The trial is how many people are we selecting? Each one of those is a trial. So how many times are we repeating this trial? How many, how many trials do we have? Twelve trials. So tell me what is our N then? Twelve. We're selecting twelve individuals. Each one of those is a trial. Every time we would get a Mexican American, that would be a successful trial. Every time we get anybody else, that would be an unsuccessful or a failure trial. You with me on this? So let's identify some of these. Our N is, of course, 12 since we're selecting 12 people, 12 individuals for this jury. Notice how you have to identify your success and your failure before I ask you the next question. And you can figure that out. You're selecting 12 people, no problem. That's N. You all clear on why N is 12? But before you answer P, notice how you had to identify what a success was. Because what does that lowercase letter P stand for again one more time? The probability of a successful trial. Of a successful trial, which is we need to know what a successful trial means. In our case, a successful trial is we already identified it. Selecting American makes American. So now you just have to look back. What's the probability that you're going to go out in your population? and you're going to randomly select somebody, and they're going to be a Mexican American. What is that? Now, where are you finding 80%? It's up there, right? It's up there. It's not given to you explicitly. It's not said the probability of selecting a Mexican American randomly from a population is 80%. You kind of have to read the problem and understand that if you have a population that's 80% Mexican American, you're selecting somebody, then the chances of randomly getting somebody that's Mexican American is 80%. That's how your population is distributed. So here, our probability of success for us is 0 0.8. Can you tell me what's the probability of failure? Great, yeah, that's clear, because the rest of our population is not Mexican American. That would be 20%. Raise your hand if you're clear on where these numbers are coming from. Cool. Let's go ahead. We have enough information because we only need these three items to find our mean and our standard deviation. So let's do that together. In order to find the mean, mean says you're going to take n times p. So in our case, our n was 12, our p was 0.80. I'm going to put that in parentheses so we don't get confused with that decimal as a multiplication. And you're going to tell me that that is how much? 9.6 Mexican Americans. Awesome. Anybody want to be the 0.6? I don't want to be the 0.6. It's only 9.6. 9.6. What does 9.6 mean? 
Well, I know it's the main. <laughs> but what does the 9.6 suggest about this? He did the trial like say 100 times. He shaved it up for not 100 times, but he did the trial a bunch of times. On average, you should get 9.6 people each time you did the trial. Okay, like I'm gonna I'm gonna American. change what you said just a little bit. If you selected a whole bunch of juries of 12 people, if you selected a whole bunch of juries of 12 people, you'd get somewhere around 9.6 on average. So that means that some you'll get nine, some you'll get 10. Some you'll, you, so you might even get 12, right? You might get zero. It's gonna happen, not happen very often if you're doing this correctly. But on average, if you average everything together, your average number of Mexican-Americans per jury would be 9.6. Remember that this is all based on success. So what this is saying is you should expect in this situation to have, this has nothing to do with Mexican-Americans, right? These numbers, this is just based on the probability of success and the number of trials you're doing. That's really all it's based on. So this says you should have 9.6 successes. Whatever you're talking about here, you should have 9.6 successes. In our case, that would be 9.6 Mexican-Americans on average if you did juries of 12 all year long, you should have 9.6 Mexican-Americans on each jury, or somewhere around 9. Richard, have you understand that? Okay, so this stands for the number of successes, about 9.6 successes. And in this case, it's selecting Mexican-Americans. Can you please go ahead and do this for me? Calculate your standard deviation. Why don't you do that on your own? Take your n times p times q, then take a square root of it, and tell me what you get after that. Just let everyone work on that right now, okay? So our n was 12, that's how many trials. p was 0.80, that's probably the success for each trial. q is 0.20, of course those are complementary with p, so we multiply those things together. Then you take a square root of it, and how much did you get? 1.385. So about 1.39, did you all get 1.39? Yeah. 1.39, that's the average distance from the mean that you should get out of this. So yeah, we're, we're not dealing with whole numbers. Even though we can't have 9.6 Mexican-Americans, we can't have that, right? I mean, everyone counts as a whole person. You know, even if you're littler or you're bigger, you're still only one person. So we can't have the 0.6. Uh, but this, this is an average. So based on everything, if we were to average those together, and the same thing happens with our standard deviation. How many will feel okay with what we're talk, talking about so far? All right. Let's go ahead. Let's figure out what is usual and what is unusual. By the way, what did usual mean for us within how many standard deviations of the mean? Two. Two, good, that would be 95%. So 95% would be our, our usual. Anything outside of that is unusual. That's where that 0.05% came from your probability. So a little, little note, just remember this. Usual would be the mean minus two standard deviations to the mean plus two standard deviations. We've done this several times, so I'm not going to walk you through it again. This is how we figure out the lower range. We take the average minus two standard deviations and the upper range, mean plus two standard deviations, that gives us our usual values. Not your head, you're still okay. Let's go ahead and do that. Our mean is 9.6. Our standard deviation is 1.39. To figure out our range, we should get a range of, of usual numbers. Range of numbers here. Of course, in the middle is going to be our 9.6. That's our mu. We want the mu minus 2 sigma. 
want the mu plus 2 sigma. So we'll take 9.6, that's our mean, minus 2 sigmas, that's 2 standard deviations of 1.39 each. Can you tell me what is 9.6 minus 2 times 1.39? Say that one more time. 6.82. Anybody else get 6.82? Are you okay on where we're getting the 6.82? You know? You're taking your 2 times 1.39. That'll give you 2.78. Subtract that from your 9.6. And that's giving you 6.82. You okay so far? You're awfully quiet today. You're scaring me a little bit. Are you all right with it? Yes. Okay. Let's do the same thing over here except add that. So we're going to add the 2.78, whatever I said it was. One more time. Stop right there and kind of recap what we've done so far. First thing we've done when we're doing our problems, first thing we did is identify success. You have to be able to do that. What is a success? What's a failure? Well, you have to do that because in order to get your mean and your standard deviation, you got to be able to identify your P and your Q, right? And your N. You can't do that unless you've identified your success. We identify those three numbers. That's all you need for your mean and standard deviation. Means pretty easy, standard deviation, square root, but still pretty easy. This gives you the average number of successes you should have every time you do your procedure. This gives you your average number of deviations, or the average distance from the mean for this situation. To find your usual and unusual, we take our mean, that's in the middle, we subtract two standard deviations, or two 1.39s, or subtract them twice, I don't really care what you do, so, somehow find this or add them twice, or add two times that. That's the same situation in every case. So we get a range of 6.82 to 12.38. Do you agree that that's the usual case here? That's usual, right? That's, that's usual. That's our range that says if you fall in there, you're, you're okay. If you're outside of that, you're not okay. Well, what's it, what's it mean? What, what are these things, what are these numbers again? This is numbers of what? In our, in our context. What is the ninth? What are these? Those are number of successes. What's our success in this situation? You can say Mexican Americans. <laughs> this is eight, uh, 6 6.82 to 12.38 Mexican Americans would be our normal range for our situation for our juries. I don't know if you're okay with that. That would be normal. Let me ask you a question then. If you had a jury of 10 Mexican Americans, would it be usual or unusual? How about seven? How about eleven? How about twelve? How about thirteen? Can you have a jury of thirteen? So here's what this says. Even if you maxed out your jury every time with Mexican Americans, would it be unusual? According to this, not. It's not unusual according to this range. So if you have a jury of all Mexican Americans for this population, for this this thing here, you're okay. How about six? Would six be usual or unusual? Be unusual. Is it going to happen every once in a while? Yeah, sure. It'd be, it, it's going to happen every once in a while. Should it happen all the time? Mm -hmm. So what this says is that your jury, every time to be considered usual, should be made up of at least half Mexican Americans. Right? Actually, more than that. Should be 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12 to be in the usual bracket. Raise your hand if you feel okay with this. Do you see how this can give you evidence in the case? All right. Let's take this one step further. Here's what actually happened. Over the course of a period of time, 870 people were selected.
over a period of time, 870 people were selected for juries for this population, or from, you know, I should say from, from this population. Here's what I want you to do, okay? This is the real life situation. This, this happened over a course of, I think mean, it's like 10 years or something like that. One county, which that, that's why it's a population, because everyone in the county are registered voters. Um, so over a period of time, 870 people were selected for juries from this population. I want you to now figure out the mean and the standard deviation. And two, I want you to give me what is usual and unusual now. So find this first, then use this to find me the usual range. Very much like we did in this example right here. I want you to do exactly this thing, only now instead of just 12, I want you to use all the people. Okay, so go ahead and do that. I'll be walking around if you guys need a hand. Bring me a book. She had a book in her hand. Oh, that would be awesome. I just thought something and then they delivered it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a cool fucking book. What? It would have been like, whoa, Mr. Bob's creepy. Just think something magically appears. Are we using that for science for that question still? Like Same population. Okay. I do. <laughs> Yeah, folks, we're dealing with the same population, so everything yeah, is the same except for one little thing. Oh. <laughs> That's why I said, from this population, oh, same population. So tell me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on this problem that we're about to do, what is your N? What is your N? Your N would be all the times you repeat this trial. 870 times you've repeated this. That's your jury selection. Listen, your, your procedure is selecting 870 people. Your trial is selecting one person at a time. How many times did you repeat your trial to accomplish your procedure? 870 times. Here, we only did it 12 times. So naturally, you're going to have some different numbers here. Okay? So find out, using your N is, as 870, what this information is. Now, did your population change? No, no. It's still the same population. You're dealing with the same population. So how much is your P? 8%. 8%. How much is your Q? 20%. So these don't change. Your population didn't change. But this is going to change. That's the only thing that changes.
Anyone find the, the mu yet? The mean? Yeah, 696. 696. Even? Yeah. I love it. Okay. Anyone find the standard deviation yet? Yes. 11.8. Would you wish to have you able to find those numbers there? Okay. What do these numbers mean? What do these numbers mean? What's this number mean? I know it's the mean. Well, what's it mean? What's that number mean? Okay, so in this situation, if we selected 870 people for juries, we would expect, because our success is the same, okay, we didn't change our success, uh, we would expect to have 696 successes, or in this case, we would expect to have somewhere really close to 696 Mexican Americans that were picked in this jury. Now, you're going to be okay with that. Is it going to be exactly 696? No. No, probably not. We'd be off from that. But this is what should have happened if it was a perfect scenario. Okie dokie? Okie dokie. This is our, our, very, our difference from the mean. difference from the mean. Now, to calculate the usual and unusual, we're going to do this situation again. I'm going to erase this up here so you have a better chance of seeing this. So in the middle, our mean was 696. And we want the mean <coughs> plus two standard deviations. That's going to give us the far right for our usual. And the mean minus two standard deviations, the far left for our usual range. So here we'll do our 696. Plus two times our sigma. And we'll do our 696 minus 2 times our sigma. Have you already done that as well? No. What's your left range? 672.4. And over here? 718.6. Oh, I see. Interesting what changed, didn't it? Interesting what changed. We actually went above the range here. Above, oh, I'm sorry, above the maximum we could actually get. But when I start getting more and more and more and more and more and more trials, it should tighten up. Because the 80% says, okay, you should be random selecting over time. That's going to really push it together. Okay, you should have only with, within this range. So yes, the range ultimately is a lot larger than this range is. It's only a range of si less than six. This is a range of more than 40, okay? But according to how many people you're selecting, that, that's kind of a tighter range right there. That's what that looks like at least. So what's usual and unusual? It'd be usual to get 673 Mexican-Americans out of this population. It would be <coughs> usual to get 719. Would it be usual to get 720? No. Could it happen? Yeah, maybe. How about 670? Is that usual? No, but it could happen. Okay, it's, it's lower than 672. That would be unusual. Higher than 690. Well, 620 or above would be unusual. Below this would be unusual. Here's what actually happened. Now, I don't, I don't know the exact number, but it was something like out of this situation, the last 10 years, about what happened. I'll, I'll go check the actual number and I'll, I'll tell you next time what it, what it was. But it was, it was something surprisingly low. Is this usual or unusual? unusual. How unusual? Very, very, very unusual. The further you get away from this, the more unusual this situation would be. Very 
very unusual. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? If these people were having a lawsuit and their statistician came up and said, hey, you know what, according to your population, according to your registered voters and the people who have licenses and the people that they draw juries out of, you have 80% Mexican American. So according to this information, if you have that, it'd be usual to be within this range. Now, your court system selected, instead of this number, this number. Is that a problem? They say, well, could this happen? Could this actually happen? Theoretically, yes, absolutely. You could, theoretically, get zero Mexican Americans on every jury. Is it likely to happen? No. This is so far away from the mean. I mean, this is like a point zero 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 zero. You do like 50 times and then one. That that's actually going to happen. So that says, well, something something might have been happening in this situation that wasn't exactly up to par. You know, maybe there was discrimination going on. Maybe some computer glitch. Something happened in this situation, but you need to fix it right now. And that's that's basically the the way that you use this idea in a real life situation. Say, okay, we can take this and determine whether something was just or not whether these people were being tried according to their peers or not. Do you guys understand the whole idea here? So this would, it would give you some sort of basis if you were like in a, a law situation or any other situation or a business situation saying, is this what should be happening here? Or is this kind of, kind of unusual when you take a look at something a little bit closer? And that's the way we use this stuff. Okay.